What is a product? When I'm talking about a product, you know, when I'm talking about either food, services, or combination of these two things. So, this is the definition of a product. So, this is by the definition of the English and the other. So, this is this is um, a piece of expertise that makes them a little bit challenging to me, but it also gives me more So there are there are trade-offs. So I'm talking about product and service. So let's start by discussing what the product development process is. And I'm gonna walk you through some of these uh, stages. So this is a process that has potentially some loop, so we're gonna assume that it's pretty linear and pretty pretty simple. So you usually start with ideation, right? Uh, ideation is coming up with new potential value source generation ideas, right? Something that is going to make sense from a consumer perspective. And in my experience, most companies have no trouble coming up with ideas. But if you do, there are many tools that you can actually acquire that enable you to uh, brainstorm better. And you could call brainstorming tools uh, online these days and find a number of them. I think I have written one of them uh, before Coming up with ideas is usually not a problem. Okay, so you start with a bunch of ideas. You need to start with a large set, by the way, if you want a pretty good one. And the odds of finding a good one are very good if you have more than 50. Then after that, you move into uh, the idea screening. Right? There are different screening tools and techniques that you can actually use. But big picture, you're going to want to look at technical capabilities and actually design the product with the technology already available. So this will have the capabilities to produce a product or deliver the service, right? So it's, is it something that can I actually uh, physically make or deliver, right? That's technical feasibility. Also another uh, important uh, screening tool is this the customer going to care about, okay? So is there a demand for the product, right? And there are different things you can consider. Also, uh, what kind of budget are we gonna need to deliver this? Also, we have the contracts in the marketplace that will enable us to sell the product. So we have already established relationships with uh, the retailers and wholesalers that are going to be able to enable us to take this product to market. So there are many things you need to consider when you're coming up with ideas. Okay. Then after you have done uh, some screening of ideas that are maybe less feasible to start with, you're going to do a, a business plan. So what you're going to do is you're going to be looking at whether you can actually make money. This is a, pro this is a projection in the future of what you expect the demand to be. So you're going to do a simple demand estimation, which we have already discussed in class how to do, but you should do that too. Okay, and get an idea of whether if you can capture sufficient market yeah, share, which may or may not be feasible, and can I actually make money? Okay. So you're going to do some financial projections case, but the most important step here is demand estimation. What would be demand for a product that can actually make money? And it is what it is. And then after your business case, after you convince a financially minded person that actually makes sense to pursue this project further, what you're going to do is you're going to try to develop the actual product. So at this stage, you still don't have a prototype. What you're doing is you've been working on the idea, you've been making sure that the idea is feasible, and then you spend some time thinking about the financial repercussions of the idea. Now it's time to start developing the product. Can I actually make it? Okay, this is where you get uh, design prototypes of the product, which is a physical product, or you start working on the idea or service and whatever the things that you need to actually make it and produce it. Okay, so you have these different components. Okay, what you can do for a prototype versus what you can do for a product have to work on this step here. Then after that uh, has already been accomplished, you're going to move to test marketing. Okay. Test marketing is a step where you try the product in the marketplace to see what the assumptions that you've made uh, in the previous stages are actually in fact true. Okay. This is 
not always done for your products. Some products are much better for this one. But products that are more risky or newer, you usually don't need them. I'm going to show you in the next slide in a few locations where products are going to come in. This is like a mini launch where you not only try the product, but also all the other marketing mix products as well. It's going to be pricing, it's going to be the promotional aspects. So you're going to basically be testing everything to see how it will be working in the market. Before you go and, and launch broadly for the entire market. Okay. And then finally, you have commercialization. This is after the test market has been successfully opened. Okay. And you go and launch the product in all worldwide. It depends on the scope of your strategy. Now, here you have, like I was mentioning before, some activities that are commonly used uh, as test markets within the United States. And the reason why they are test is because they are supposedly representative of what demand will be for the entire uh, manufacturing with multiple other cities, usually at least in sense for what's going to happen uh, countrywide. Now, let me give you a warning about test markets. The problem with test markets oftentimes is that competitors know that you are test marketing something, and because of that, they will manufacture to your results anyway. So they will lower the prices only in the locations where you have test marketing of products that they might have that are competitive and because of that, they're testing them all the time and not actually the destination for the entire country because they might not be able to lower the prices countrywide. Okay, so you need to be aware that competitors when they look this marketing something and because of that, the results may actually not be what you want them. So there are challenges and there are ways of solving them. You cannot just simulate the same test and then test and then just lower the price. Okay, now let me mention this regardless of whether it's a test market or not, most new products fail. Here you have a silly example. Products, I think this is a brand extension of for Colgate. Okay, Colgate uh, Primer, I think it's not exactly. Oh, anyway, this is a real product. Okay, so a lot of the products fail. Some of them, like this one, because they had no business to be launched in the first place. I don't know how this went to the process that I just described that you know, kind of uh, ended up being commercialized in the end because they had no business. Okay, but having said that, most products, regardless of how okay, crazy they are. They fail at the rate of between 70 and 90 percent, depending on how you define failure. Okay, usually, failure you define it as uh, being out of the market in three years, again, it's a pretty easy lower. But if you look at projections of uh, revenue, you know, the and amount of money spent and the amount of profit earned, most products don't make it to the estimate that you would have. So, new product development is a risk but you have to develop new products. And the reason why is because even though it's risky to launch them, they might end up failing. The ones that don't fail are the ones that will kind of going to carry your company through into the future. If you don't develop new products, you will become irrelevant and the market will continue to go up. Now, when it comes to new products, there are different types of products. So, and, and here we're going to make a distinction from the perspective of the consumer as opposed to just looking at some of the perspectives before what products are selected. What we're going to be looking at here is the way people buy products. And one of the important aspects of buying a product in this case, in this search that we're going to be undergo as a consumer, is the amount of information or data that you conduct. So this is the idea of you know how how much time you spend collecting information about new products and product categories so that you can make better uh, decisions. Okay. Other aspects that we're going to have Evaluate products you know, in a simple way where you use heuristics, but you know, sometimes you see products that are more refined and you just use the standard product method and things like that. Or do you really take into consideration every potential aspect, you know, from the sex of the product to the warranty of the product? Because if you are using a lot of that information, the, the way you're going to be evaluating products will change. So, based on this, Convenience products are products where the amount of information search that is done by the consumer is pretty light, so there is barely any information search done, okay, and there's very minimal, and or uh, the amount of time spent in decision making is almost automatic. So these are products that you're buying usually by habit. Okay. 
great example of convenience products are anything that you will see next to a checkout in any large store. And you have all these things like stamps, cigarette lighters, and now in the market you will find a USB cable. So there are a lot of products like these candy that are placed in there, and these are products that if you see them, they're selling many more information so that you are not worried that they are there. And then based on that, you quickly make a decision about where you want to go. Also, the products that are traditional are usually very slow of running, so usually convenience products are not the kind of traditional items that they become very slow. Good. Number two is shopping products. These are products that people spend a significant amount of uh, time in, in looking for information. And also, when they are going through their deliberation about these products, you see some considerations that looking if you go online at the products that are available, maybe asking your friends or having family to look at products, or maybe just going to the store and looking at what's in, in the shop. Those are all information search strategies and they're all viable information. So you do a fair amount of that, and then after that you spend a fair amount of time thinking about which products to buy, right? And these are typically things like durable goods, cars, telephones, laptops, Clothing could be, right? It depends on when you're taking time off. But a lot of these products, uh, people spend less time looking for and more time considering which one to buy or not. But there is some trading off between different products. So there is some substitution that can happen in different products. Now, finally, you have specialty products. Now, these are products where the consumer is particularly interested in certain characteristics of the product. And because of that, they're going to go out of the way in terms of effort that they're going to put to look at these products and acquire them. Okay. And so because of this, what's going to happen is the consumer is going to be less willing to trade off between different features or aspects of the product. And because of that, it is going to be less substitution. So these are products that the customer is searching specifically for. Okay. Typical uh, products that would be considered here would be things like designer clothing. So when I was saying before, clothing for me is a lot of imagination, but if you are a big brand partner and you're very looking for a particular brand of clothing, for example, or a particular model, or a particular brand of clothing of a manufacturer, then we consider that a specialty product because you're probably not going to be willing to trade off or just buy a generic product. Right? So these are things that you go out of your way. For example, a rock cut, right? I mean, if you want to listen to your favorite band, you want to be that bad, you are not in the need for a paper. Right? So because of that, the way you go through the search process, you're going to be planning this ahead of time, you're going to be doing a lot more search if you need it, right? And then uh, you're really going to not be very interested in trading off and completing other options. Okay? So these two products are very different from a consumer product. And the way we're going to market them are going to be different because we need to continue to track that people are going to shop shop for them. Then uh, within products, uh, because most companies have more than one product, we're going to talk about two different uh, specific aspects that are important. One is the product mix. Product mix is uh, all the combination of products and essentially things that are sold by the company that is making it. Okay, so this is kind of like a portfolio that some of you guys use to do searches uh, of all your products and essentially the things that are sold in the market. And this is kind of like a collection of that information. From a strategy standpoint, oftentimes the product mix is hard to manage. So what we do is we break it down into product lines. Now product lines are groups of products. So within a line you have a group of products that are strategically similar in some way. Okay, it could be uh, in the type of benefit that they are fulfilling for the consumer. It could be in the way you price it. It could be in the way you sell the product to the consumer. Let me show you what we mean by a product line and a product mix as an example. Okay. Here you have a Colgate Formulaic product mix. A brief description. There are a lot more uh, specific products in here, but this kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Okay. And you can see the product mix is the collection of all the products that are sold by the company. And here, there is quite a bit of brand, right? Because Palmolive and uh, Colgate uh, sells uh, different types of products from toothpaste to deodorant to uh, cleaning 
us in the uh, to set it. So because of that, uh, trying to come up with a strategy that works for all the products and for the entire product is kind of difficult. So what do we do? We create this line of products. So this is the line one, line two, line and as you can see, it doesn't really matter how many products are in the product line. What matters is the fact that pet nutrition, even though there are only a few types of product lines, uh, pet nutrition is probably very different from, I don't know, all of their customers. So because of this, what you're going to do is you're going to treat them based on this instruction from a marketing strategy. So you're going to use this concept of the product line to determine which products are going to be managed. So everything within a product line probably you're gonna make decisions that make more sense. Okay, but at least those decisions are gonna be coordinated so that you can make a price change in all of the uh, like in this case it might actually have an impact on some of your products that don't follow care. But if you do that, that should probably have no bearing on what happens in the line. So because of that, we use this concept of product line to make strategic decisions that make sense not only at the product level, but also at the group of products that are user-related or part of the same product. Now, every product has a product life cycle, what do I mean by that? And products are in a way like people, right? So from the moment you are born to the moment you actually die, you go through different stages in life where things that happen to you, they are very similar to everybody else that is in the same cohort or in the same time frame toddlers are and teenagers and young and adults and, and they all have different things going on for them. And the same thing is going to happen in a product. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down the life cycle of a product in four main stages. So we're going to talk about introduction, growth, maturity, and then the decline stage. Now let me walk you through what this means a little bit in a diagram. So here we have a typical uh, picture that you will use to detect what the product life cycle is. Okay, let me walk you through what these things are. Let me start with the bottom. The axis at the bottom is time. Okay, so time is really the axis that is increasing. It starts at zero here, and then it goes and it gets bigger as you move towards the top. Right? So time is going on here. So this is where the product is being produced. Zero means the product is launched into the marketplace. That product being by the way, this is not for specific products. This is for the product category. So, for example, if you're looking at a laptop, right, you will see this when the first laptop was introduced in the marketplace. And this one is the existing product that is being produced. So, this is this is a, this curve shape that you see here. It's a regularity that we have seen in many, many product categories across the board. If you aggregate for the entire industry. And this is for all laptops, not for the specific model. And in a specific model, you might see this curve shape or you might see it like this. Okay. Now, what else do we have in the other axis here? In, in the y axis, we have here usually either units. Okay, this is what you can see here in the blue line. Or it could also be dollars. You have in the red line. So we have two diagrams here combined. I'm going to first talk about the blue one, which is sales and units, and then we're going to talk about profit. Okay. Now, what you're going to see here is you're going to see that in the introdu introductory stage, what happens is obviously sales are pretty low in the beginning, they are zero right now. So this diagram is better to look at. Okay. And what you can see in this line, the blue line, is that as time goes by, Sales are increasing in price. And the slope of this curve, it tends to ramp up in the growth stage. Okay. That's when the product starts to become quite a bit widespread, be available in the marketplace, and people are really interested in the product. In the introductory stage, you have only a few people in the marketplace because the product tends to be very expensive. By the way, if you were to plot price, which is not here, but you will see in reality that price is probably going to be decreasing over time. So it's going to start, okay, by the way, the axis is not going to go, but 
price will start high and it will decrease over time. So usually it will take a real price increase. And then at the end you're gonna have a good time. And I'll explain the price to you. Okay, anyway. So you have a sales here in the blue line, not the black line, but as you saw the price. And then price, price. And in the blue line, what you can see is how this curve ramps up to the middle, and then eventually the market matures. Okay, and here you can see the maturity by the curve basically flattening out and eventually starts to go up and it goes down and it declines. And this should come as no surprise to you because you know that that's what time products stop becoming as popular. In a better way, because you get more management, but if you want to improve the computers, you can start as a mainframe, then after the mainframe, you can have personal computers, then after the personal computers, you have laptops, then after the laptops, you know, you can even have a tablet and a cell phone, and then it gets a lot of things and, and you know, so, so what happens over time is these product categories mature. cars and all the trains and then all that, right? So you can see this cycle happening with most of the products. Now notice one more thing, which is that profits are going to move slightly different than sales. Okay. And I want you to notice that in the beginning they just even though sales are growing and they are passing, profits are going to be negative. You're gonna be losing money and you're gonna if your field demand is low buying the product. So at this point you're not going to be making money. Okay? And when you're going to start making money, when most of the money is made, you're going to go and mostly you're going to sell the product. That's where you make most of your money. And then finally at the end, you know, find something like the management. Okay? Let me talk about price for a minute. Like I said, in most product categories what you're going to see is this downward slope in price. So price is going to start high beginning and it's going to drop over time which makes sense why does it drop over time because as you start selling more and more units of the product you're going to have an incentive to drop the price because you're going to become efficient at it and you're going to be able to make the product more efficient but not only that you're going to have more and more competition so what's going to happen is that as people see that you're actually making money and selling a lot of units of this product what they're going to do is they're going to have competition because of that, your price is going to drop. Because you're going to have more competitors, everybody is going to keep selling less, and you're going to end up with a lower price. And now, let me explain this thing. At the end, the price is going to have a little swing in here. Uh, and you see this a lot when a lot of the competitors get out of the market because they have products in decline, and they are less and less competitive and they start making more products. So as less and less competitors are in the market, they they should buy because they're going to get back the demand, because even if it's low, if it's higher than the low supply, they're going to improve their demand and have such an increase, not an increase, but such an increase in price, because you just cannot buy that. So if you're trying to buy, for example, a new video game for an old console like a Sega uh, video game console, because they stopped being made maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, you actually want to find somebody who can, the prices have gone up and the reason why is because they're not in the market now. Same thing is true of one computer. And here you have some products uh, that you can buy today in the marketplace that will give you an idea of what kind of products are in what stages. So you have uh, ultra high definition TV. I think now we're moving to 4K. Moving up in a hurry. Uh, maybe hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, I, I'm not sure this technology is going to take off in the industry because it does have some challenges and people have been working on it for a long time. But they're definitely going to come up with a solution that you cannot find. 
one of these vehicles than most places. I know Honda has over some of them in California under the brand name of Clarity, but we see what happens in that case. And in the growth phase, we have products like 3D printers, which are pretty popular right now, which is coming in town. You have Airbnb like in terms of services, and you have keto and paleo products. Oneself or not, but those products are in the growth phase. And maturity stage, you have things like laptops and cell phone laptops that are starting to decline, although they're still pretty high in the marketplace. And I have this thing there, and software, like demand for software in the US has been pretty steady and for lately becoming over the next few years. There are a few exceptions. And then you have in the design stage of things like newspapers, right? That are having a heck of a time. A lot of them are doing images and things like that. So definitely in the design stage. Landline phones, I don't know if you guys have any of them. Now, they, if you look at pay phones, they've been trending like crazy at this point for the most part. And then you have in desktop computers, like these things that have been around the last few years or so. But unless you have really high high performance requirements, then you don't you don't use things like this. Okay. Now other than the product life cycle, like important uh, issues with product, strategy is branding. Like brand, brand, brand. And what is a brand? Brand is something that uniquely identifies your product or service. And when I say something, it could be a name, it could be a logo, it could be a combination of colors, it really doesn't matter. Anything that you may hear and call your product is a brand. So branding is the process of creating this brand and then developing it over time. So we have some of our branders. And how do you choose the name? Like there is a lot that goes into it. First is the name that has to be unique. So nobody else has has already used exactly the same name. So you don't have to do a legal search and make sure that you can trademark your brand. And this is different, obviously, in different countries. So if you're late to the party in some other country, you might have to switch your name. So because of that, people will assume that you switched your app from. If you're a small firm, you might have to change your name and things like that. So something to just be aware of is when you need to do some planning in other countries to make sure that you have that. Okay. And other main considerations need to be simple to pronounce. Sometimes companies struggle with this. Especially if you are entering into the market later in the United States, for example, Mitsubishi, which is a Japanese car manufacturer, uh, had to have a really lengthy uh, ad campaign in the 80s when Mitsubishi came into the United States for the first time just to let uh, the US consumer uh, know how the name brand was pronounced. So it was just a series of commercials to make Somewhat catchy, it's not easy to say what you want your brand to look like. So, some that would just say the name of the company for 30 seconds of talking, and people will understand how to pronounce it and just be aware of it. So, it is a little bit of a challenge to, to kind of pronounce the, the brand name. And sometimes you pick the brand name to hint at the benefits that you get from the product, like PMGs. Head and shoulder shampoo is an example. And, but anyway, there are many considerations that go into this. And, and then what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that you file for a trademark on your brand so that you can use that intellectual property instead. You shouldn't get compromised because of something that you can do later on. The physical aspect of it. Now, what are the different types? of brands from a sponsorship perspective and you have manufacturer brands right these are the ones that are going to be the ones that have a certain different name and you know package products these are all uh, manufacturer brands like Nutella, 
subscription channel and subscription channel and channel for gifts, peanut butter, we are like okay, and healthy and many other products like all the coffees, coffee and all. But these are all household names that everybody has and has been using for at least ten years or so, maybe. Uh, but these are many things people are doing for food and many, many, many other things. Now then you have a type of brand that has become extremely important in some industries and in some some of my industries, and which are called private distributor brands and or store brands in some cases. Okay. And Tilly is I have an example of something that's in Thailand right now and it's a company called Brand Me, which is created by the toilet paper. So the idea that toilet paper in Thailand now is very nice and that, that's the take of all. The important part is that these are brands that are sponsored by the retailer and the store that is selling the product to the final consumer. In this case, it will be Walmart. Okay, but every car manufacturer, every retail manufacturer is going to have brands in their name that are store brands. And these are extremely popular and Upwards of 60% comes from store brands and they have been such an amazing brand. Okay. You will not see this, for example, happen in some other countries. But you will see tons of the products and tons of financial reasons for people to become store brands becoming store brands. Okay. And then finally we have generic products. And generic products are kind of similar to that. But these are products that you sell the product with no advertising. Now, other than the actual brand name, and what other aspects are associated with branding that are important? Okay. Let me talk to you about a few. You have packaging. Now, packaging is basically the external container that keeps the integrity of the product from being fragmented and might have some information that um, describes the product to the consumer. Packaging can actually be used for branding and branding and marketing. A nice simple example of this that I'm sure you're aware of is Amazon branding their packaging, but you can use the name Amazon Love and it's like two way packaging. Right? So there is some branding and sort of branding effort that can be manufactured. And there are a lot of um, products that have successfully created value by adding uh, innovative packaging. Really simple ideas like taking a ketchup bottle, making it out of plastic instead of glass, and putting the cup, making the cup flat and big so that you can turn it upside down so that it's easier to uh, get the product out of the package. And it seems like a very simple idea, but for over a hundred years, nobody thought of it. So you can actually innovate and create value with the package. You have labeling, which is information that is in the package. And what is like uh, in the product. Okay. This could have some benefit of food, right? Because you regulate the label length by keeping a clear uh, number of minimum spacing, which uh, will be used issuing um, directives that require food manufacturers to describe in detail all the ingredients that are in the product, especially, for example, allergens. And then also information about the caloric content of the product. So this is information about the product, but then there's also information about the product. Now, having said this about branding and packaging and labeling, one of the key aspects of the product can be innovative product quality. Now, notice one thing. Quality is largely defined here as the product performance adequately, and adequately is going to be determined by who and the brand. So product quality that there is no that less quality and less quality and product quality is not that much of a thing. There is in some of our markets. And, but um, the perception is not always 100% minus the product. So product quality 
Let's talk a little bit about price. So we talked a little bit about the product. Now price is a unique uh, it's a unique element within the whole piece and the reason why I just people. One is probably the most flexible of all the elements in the market. Okay. So let's start by defining price is what you give up to acquire and deploy the product. You said. And that's usually a combination of monetary price, but also it could be other things like time spent looking through the instructions, and, right? And time spent tinkering with it. So it's not just money, although it could be an important aspect, but it's just everything that you give up to acquire and use a product. Okay, that's price. Now, having said that, price is unique in many ways. One, uh, the most important thing is that it directly relates to revenue, right? So, directly relates to revenue. How does it relate to revenue? If you remember, revenue is what? It's your price times your quantity, right? So, it's the amount of units you sell multiplied by the price. So, because of that, price is directly related to revenue, and revenue is directly related to profit. Now let me notice one thing in this equation that I just drew right here, is that uh, it's more complicated than what I'm letting you see by just doing this. Because if you raise your price, two things are going to happen. Your price is gonna go up, so you might think, ah, oh, the higher the price, the better, because my revenue is gonna become bigger and bigger. But that's not truly uh, the case, right? Because that Q in there, which is the quantity sold, is gonna be also a function of price. Because as I increase my my price, what's going to happen is my quantity is going to go down. So it's not directly obvious what's going to happen with revenue if you increase price. So because of this, selecting the optimal price is a tricky business. It's not easy. If it was the more I charge, the more money I make, then everybody will know how to price. But that's not how it works, right? The pricing is tricky. And it's extremely powerful, okay, because it's directly related to revenue and price. And number two, it's very flexible. It's one of those things that you can do a, a lot of changes in there. Whereas changing products is very costly and expensive, doing changes with advertising in your car, changing your channels of distribution is an absolute nightmare, very expensive and very complicated. So changing your price is relatively easy. So it's very flexible, okay, and very powerful. And so that is one of the Tools that you should give it the most, the most part. All of them are important, but this is particular. Now, the pricing strategy is going to depend on what you're trying to achieve. Okay. We're going to go back to pricing objectives, right? And we're going to have different types of objectives. It really depends what you're trying to do with your product and what you're trying to achieve. It's going to dictate your pricing. Let me walk you through the typical. Common strategies that you can use or, or objectives that you're trying to achieve with your price. The number one is maximizing profit. And this is tricky to do, by the way, in real life, but you need to understand that uh, because of this equation that I just drew right here, you try to maximize profit. Profits and revenue are related. So, profit, pi gonna be what? It's gonna be your revenue minus your cost. Okay. 
So because of that, if you're trying to maximize this equation, uh, this is right here. Price is going to play a role because it's part of that R. Okay. So that revenue is there. As you can see over here. They are related, right? Price is an important part of that function and it's not trivial. So typically, if you're trying to maximize profit, your prices will be relatively high. But the question is not relatively, but exactly how high it should be. Okay. There is specific tools that you can use for that. You need to look at things like demand estimation, which we have talked a little bit about. But also you look at something called elasticity that tells you how demand changes with price. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about that too much in class, but I want you guys to be aware of that. Okay. So if you take another marketing class, that's one of the aspects that you Another thing that you can try to consider to do instead of trying to maximize okay, profit is increasing your market share. Now notice one thing, market share and revenue are very close to net share. So if you're trying to increase market share, what you're trying to do is you're trying to sell more and more units, and the way to typically do that is to lower your price. So now what that exactly looks like and to what extent you're gonna do that relatively low price, that's again, an empirical issue, right? But I want you to realize that maximizing profit tends to increase your price, everything else being all constant, and increasing your market share usually leads to the opposite to the effect. Okay. And and then there are other things that you might try to achieve other than these two, which are probably the most popular goals, and you might be trying to maintain Winning here by maintaining the status quo. Status quo is how things are right now. Okay, and the most basic requirement or objective that you can have for price is to provide order. Right, so that is to sell sufficient uh, quantity that you are going to be selling. Okay, and you can do a breakdown of that to what price you should be selling in that case. Now, how do you go about? Pricing products in general. Uh, in general, there are two strategies which I have come across for me. It's either to charge a high price or a low price. Okay. But uh, we give different names to some of these strategies. I don't know if I can keep on this trip or not. And uh, if you're looking at new product pricing, one thing that you will see a lot is this term called price skimmer. This actually comes from farming and from milk in particular. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of extracting milk directly from a cow using a bucket, but if you've done that, one thing that you will know is that in raw milk, what you will get at the top of the bucket is a thick layer of fat. And that's called the cream of the milk, which is what you normally see in milk. And, but the reason why you have this is because cream is really high in fat, and fat is less dense than water, which is what you know we know that water will convert to sugar in some protein. And so the cream will float on top of the milk. So what do you do to get the cream, which is the best part of the milk? You skim the milk. You take that top layer of fat from the milk, and that's why you call charging a high price price skimming which is taking the best part of the market which is the top of the market. And how do you do that? By charging a high price. What do I mean by the top of the market? Those are the people that are willing to pay the most for your product or service. So that's what price can be. And you have also penetration pricing, which is the opposite, right? So I was telling you that there are two key strategies, either pricing high or pricing low. Well, another way of talking about a low price is called penetration pricing, which is trying to lower the price so that you can make the product more popular in the marketplace and increase your winning profit. So Chuck is trying to gain market share at the cost of profitability by the way, the winning case. Other pricing strategies that you might hear about, right? One is psychological pricing. The way consumers make decisions is not relative, it's not always rational. And because of that, what people do is they try to leverage the fact that we make decisions in an imperfect fashion. One way of doing that is this idea of even or odd pricing, 
particular oil pricing. Let me talk about what oil pricing is. If you've ever seen a price like this, $9.99, what they are trying to do, this is called oil pricing. And they're trying to do is they're trying to give you the impression that you're paying less than a thousand dollars. But everybody knows that there is almost no difference between nine ninety-nine and a thousand. But for some reason in our brain it registers differently. So all pricing is charging these prices that end with some sort of nine, trying to give the impression to the customer that you're actually paying less than what you are indeed paying. Another type of psychological pricing is this idea of Received pricing, which is charging a high price to indicate to the customer that the product is particularly valuable or has a high quality, right? So this idea is that by charging a high price, you're signaling or you're telling information to the customer about the product or prestige associated with that product. Another important aspect that you need to consider from a Consumer perspective is this idea of reference pricing, which is customers using some sort of uh, anchor point uh, for making their judgments about uh, price. So this is when you are actually buying a product and you are, for example, using as a reference price other options that are on the shelf. So if everybody is charging $10 for something and you see a product that is 4 you might just be wondering whether a product that has good quality could actually be sold for that little, right? So you're using a reference price. And consumers use all sorts of reference prices and you need to be aware of which ones are actually relevant in a product category because they will set what kind of tone uh, your price should actually have. Another example of reference pricing, if you're trying to sell a very expensive car, like let's say a Bugatti Bayer, right, which is over a million dollars for a car, that looks very expensive if you compare it with other cars. And I'm not talking about good cars. Maybe if you compare it to a, an everyday, <laughs> everyday quote unquote Ferrari, right, which starts about three hundred or four hundred thousand, a million is still more than twice as much, right? So that looks really expensive. However, if you put that variant in the same show that is trying to sell you a jet, which is another plane, another car, and the Average selling price for a plane, I'm talking about something like a gold screen, right? And if the average price is in the tens of millions, now suddenly this car looks like an absolute bargain. So, what the consumer is using as a reference price is going to be relevant for your pricing strategy because it's going to determine what works and what doesn't work. Okay, so maybe sell really expensive things close to things that are even expensive more expensive okay. okay and and then and given discounts on prices by the way instead of dropping the price it's smart if you can do other things that enable you to maybe drop the price occasionally so that you don't need to cut your profitability across the board how do you do that well you could give a discount in price to people that buy more this is called a quantity discount right you're not saying it makes a lot of sense you're buying a lot of my product i will sell it to you for cheaper because you are buying a large amount of it. Right? So I'm not giving a price discount to everybody, but only my best customers. So this is going to have implications for profitability, and it actually makes a lot of sense. So you don't have to cut the price across the board. Another thing that is used a lot is seasonal pricing. What this means is that there might be a particular time where your prices are cut. Uh, this could be uh, going with the season. You see this, for example, in clothing. Season is like this. But so if you go in the fall and you're trying to buy winter clothes, you'll get them for a really low price because now that you know, spring is coming, nobody's going to buy a jacket. So what do you do with the jacket you have? You discount it, right? So that would be a seasonal discount. Okay. But this seasonal discount can also be applied in a smaller time frame, right? So if you go to a restaurant, which I'm pretty sure now we can because they are closed, but assuming that this was uh, not the coronavirus pandemic situation, if you were going to a restaurant, uh, there are things called happy hour in clothing. And the idea that is to give a reduced price uh, on some products or all the products, it depends on the restaurant. And the idea is you're trying to attract customers when the, uh, when the restaurant is at its lowest demand time, right? So, most people come for lunch 
before dinner. So what you do, you have happy hour, maybe a couple of hours before dinner, try to attract your customer. So you're reducing your prices only for a limited time. 